giving instructions on what we do with this truth. Of all that we just learned in the book of Revelation, of all that we know that is to come, this is how it is to affect our life. It is our response to knowing what is coming. How to make this book practical. <clears throat> you see, heaven is not just a destination. Heaven is a motivation in our life. Knowing what we have coming should be a great motivation for us. It's just too often our faith is small. We get so caught up in the things of this world. We, do, we really do lose proper perspective on what is to come. When we have this in orders, we're going to see it really does help us to follow verses like Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3, the motivation was all who Christ was in the first two chapters. When you come to chapter 3, it now tries to make it practical. Seek those things which are above. Keep, in other words, he's saying keep yourself heavenly minded, focused on the eternal. That's where John's going with this now, to focus on the eternal. Seek those things which are above. It helps you not to get so bent out of shape when things go wrong here. It's very temporary here. It really is. Think about it. We are here for such a short, short time. And he is, think what he's just revealed here, here to us in this book. What eternity is going to be like. I mean, the bulk of it from chapter 4, obviously coming all the way up into verses 19 and 20, dealing with the, those final judgments hitting the earth. And then how all this ends, what it's going to come about, how that kingdom on the earth begins, what happens when that's over with, with a new heaven, a new earth, what that's going to be like, giving us a glimpse of that. He's saying, listen, this is what it's all about. It helps us to keep things in perspective. I mean, think of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The same thing that John is doing here in the rest of this chapter is what Paul was doing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he talked about his life here on the earth. And how difficult it was. Beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. I mean, the guy never knew what was going to happen to him at the next city he went to. But he knew after he preached, more than likely something bad was going to happen. In prison, beating, whatever was going to take place, it was likely. He had enemies following him everywhere he went. Yet the guy never quit. To the, to the point you get to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. The conclusion of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what he said basically was this, I kept my eyes on heaven. He stayed focused on the eternal and not the temporal. And this is how we use the book of Revelation and understanding what is to come. <clears throat> you know, let's, let's, let's face it. it. As we're heading into winter now, that, you know, I, do we move the? Is it this Saturday? Move the clocks back or two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. We'll move, move the clocks back. So then we got like, and just think that we're already. What is today's date? Say twenty first. Twenty third. We are less than eight weeks until we start gaining daylight already. We're less than eight. So that's good. But you're going to head into the darkness. Let's say it's January fifteenth and February first. You're heading to Hawaii for two weeks. Do you think you have an extra little pep in your step, knowing what was coming in two weeks? Of course you would. You would have that anticipation. You'd be like, I hope it gets cold because I'm out of it. <laughs> you wouldn't care. It wouldn't matter. Now, when you come back from that, that's different, isn't it? That Monday when you're back, that's, that's a different day, isn't it? That anticipation is gone. Well, this rest doesn't end. And it is literally right around the corner. Whether, I mean, think about this. Think of how short it is. The reality is, if Christ doesn't return in our generation, not one person, very unlikely, one person in this room, including all babies, will be alive 100 years from now. All of us will be gone. Every single person, from the nursery uh, all the way to Bob if he was here. <laughs> Bob might still be here. I take that back. He might be the only one still here. <laughs> I think those ties keep them alive. I'm not sure. We see this motivation used throughout Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, it, it, gives, us, it gives us those who used uh, uh, the idea of that eternal rest in heaven as a motivation. Abraham, looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. It was a motivation, not a destination. We see, as, as you continue on through Hebrews chapter 11, I can't remember, you go down four or five verses, it mentions others who had the same thing, looking for that city. He's just described it for us. 
Matter of fact, now it's been revealed. We know what's going to take place. Again, the fact of, of us knowing what is coming should not lead us to be complacent, but to draw us closer. To use this knowledge to be a help to you, a motivation in your life. Now, John has finished seeing all the visions that he's going to. It's, that's all concluded now. It's over with. This is the last words of this book. I mean, think of how all this got started back in chapter 1 when he saw Christ in his glorified form and he tried to describe it in chapter 1. It's amazing. To getting into the, the, the letters to the seven churches. To chapter 4 when he's taken from there to the throne room of God. And the visions begin. This is what's going to shortly come to pass. Again, amazing what all he witnessed in his visions. He saw what is going to happen. What would take place leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. What would take place uh, up until the time the kingdom itself was on the earth and what that would look like. He saw what it was going to look like after. He literally saw the new heaven and new earth. He saw new Jerusalem coming down. He witnessed it. Really, he was given sight to see like no other prophet of God has ever been. So now it's tying all this together with this epilogue, with these last several verses of the book. And what we're going to look at today is five things in this section that are given to us in response. We are to believe, we're to keep, we're to worship, we're to proclaim, and we're to anticipate. So let's dive into this a little bit. First off, we're to believe. I think you'll understand why he starts off with this when we dive into it. <clears throat> Verse number 6. He says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his holy angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So the same angel that was part of, of the vials that had, had, had actually delivered one of the vials of the final judgment that has been dealing with John. He's the same one that's talking here. And he comes to John and he proclaims to John, listen, all that you have seen is faithful and true. Everything you just witnessed is going to come to pass. Again, think of all that John has witnessed. He literally saw... Two to three occasions, the world shaken in such a... On two of the occasions, the entire earth moved. Literally shaken. He literally saw a, a transformation of the universe. He saw demons coming out of hell. He saw the rise of the Antichrist. He saw the water turn to blood. He saw the vegetation burned up. I mean, vision after vision, he literally saw the return of Christ. He saw what it was going to be like when all the armies of the earth are destroyed at his return. He saw some incredible things. He saw the millennial reign. He saw the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem. Not only that, he saw the judgment day of the lost. This was not some bizarre dream is what the angels tell him as he concludes. He said, John, listen, what you have just seen is faithful and it's true. This isn't some mystical image you have right now. This is what's going to take place. He saw what will happen and happen shortly. In other words, this is not an allegory. You're not to spiritualize this book. There's not some truth hidden, some mass story. It's not about finding out some secret code in the book of Revelation. So many today try to spiritualize this book to fit their unscriptural view of eschatology. What he says the visions that were given and the words that were given were faithful and true. He's saying, believe it. This is what's going to happen. Again, this is not an allegory. This is what's going to take place. He even compares it to the holy prophets of old. And remember, God's prophetic record is perfect. It is. He told of the destruction of the northern kingdom and it was destroyed. He told of the destruction of the southern, the captivity of the southern kingdom. And that's exactly what took place. He it, 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 I mean, we go out to prophecy after prophecy. The, the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, being born of a virgin. On and on and on and on. Perfectly fulfilled. <clears throat> I 
Again, so many try and look for the hidden. It's amazing how the devil works. They look for the hidden instead of the obvious. Instead of what's right there in black and white. Again, this is not an allegory. This is what's going to take place. Really, that is a comfort to know what the Bible says is true. Everything, not just the book of Revelation. The fact is, and this is so true, it doesn't really take a a lot of faith at all to believe the Bible is God's word. It really doesn't. I mean, when you think of how amazing this book is, it doesn't take a lot of faith to conclude this is in fact the word of God. It is incredible. Number two in verse seven, to keep it or be obedient. This is interesting. The angel is speaking. Well, let me read the verse first. In verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the, of the prophecy of this book. So the second thing here, the first, he was to believe it. Number two was to keep it. So the angel concluded about these things shortly being done. And then understand what takes place here. Here's John. The angel's talking to him. And the next voice he hears, once he makes that statement about shortly be done, all of a sudden Jesus Christ himself interjects now. And he tells John, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. The saying, I come quickly, is found six times in the book of Revelation. It's found three of those times right here in this chapter. Verse 20, and back up, I believe, was it verse 12? Yeah, verse 12 and verse 20 in addition to this. But six times total. Twice it's given as a warning. Chapter 2 in the letters of the churches in verse 5 and 16, it talks about coming in judgment. Four times as a promise. Three of those we see here in chapter 22. Chapter 3 and 11, it's given as a promise as well. Six times it is said, I come quickly. Now, some debate over the meaning here. I still remember a message preached on the radio from a Baptist preacher here in Anchorage back in 1997 over the wording of this verse. It was actually a message to refute a a, a meeting that had taken place in Seward, Alaska, a pastor's meeting that had taken place, and it was questioning the, the, the King James Bible and the translation of the word here. It was somebody trying to demonstrate there's an error right here. There is no error right here. He was saying what this means here is, and I still remember it being shocked when I heard the statement. I, we knew it was coming. Word had traveled fast that he was going to preach a, a rebuttal sermon that night. So I listened to it on the radio. And he made me cringe when he got to this portion. When he, he stated this, he said, he, he sort of mocked it. He said, the idea of this quickly, it, it really shouldn't have been translated that way. He had said, because where is he? It's been 2,000 years. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. He said, what it really means is that it will come in a twinkling of an eye. He tried to relate it to that passage. That's not what he's dealing with. It is talking about, even from the time he's talking with John, that it, his, his time of returning is soon. You say, but it's been 2,000 years. Hello, a day's, a day's as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. In light of eternity, this has been nothing. It's not going to be 100,000 years from now. That's just still a drop in the bucket. Do you understand that? It's been a short time. That's it. You think when you read the book of Genesis, think of how much time you cover in the first six chapters. It's been nothing. And by looking at the world right now, it does appear as we are literally on the threshold of his return. And it's only been 2,000 years. The fact is, Christ's return in regards to the rapture is imminent. That's been a belief since the very first century. You see it in the New Testament letters, the belief of the eminent return of Jesus Christ. Verse after verse, especially in Paul's epistles, where you see it plainly believing he could come any time right now. It could take place. Remember, one of the common greetings was saying what in the first century of the church? Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. It, watch me miss it what, it, what it means now. So come Lord. That's what they were saying to each other. They believed it was there. It is imminent. 
You can read verse after verse that shows they believe that. So he lets him know, behold, I come quickly. He said, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, this is the six that we I address this action, the very first message. Um, this is the sixth of the seven Beatitudes that are given in the book of Revelation. There's going to be one more given. We'll look at that next week. Again, a Beatitude is just something that begins with the word blessed. Um, you know, you have the Sermon on the Mount that starts out with the Beatitudes, blessed are, you know, etc. Chapter 1 and verse 3, we had our first, blessed he that about the reading and the hearing. Uh, and keeping of the words of this book. Now, notice how it transitions, because it's a similar verse to chapter 1 and verse 3, that now the concluding section here in 22 and, and um, verse 7. But, it, but now it's already written, so the focus switches to the keeping of it now, because he's trying to make it practical, all right? We know what's coming. What do we do with it? We have to obey it. We have to keep it. It says we need to keep now, this word has a couple of different meanings. I'm going to give the definition out of, of, of the Greek word that's given here. It means to keep, to hold fast, to guard, to hold on to, to hold captive, to make one's own, to possess. So he's saying when it comes to the words of this prophecy, of all that I have just written, this is something that you are to keep, to hold fast to, to possess, to make it your own. So it does deal with obeying, of course. But think about this. What commands have been given to obey in this book. Think about it. From, from chapter 4 on, zero. You can almost say zero for the entire book, but there are some given in relation to the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. But they're in context of the churches. We certainly could apply and hold fast to that, which you have, and different things like that. But for straight-up commands, zero. So how do you obey when there's no command? Well, it's, it's fairly simple. I'm going to read what one commentator said. He said this, you know that Jesus Christ is coming as a result of, of what this book states, is, is what he's referring to. You know that he could come at any moment. It said, so long for his coming, you long for the eternal fellowship, desire heaven, desire holiness, desire Christ, vindicated and glorified. That's the spirit of this book. Desire the end of the curse. Desire a new heaven and a new earth. Live for the eternal state. God didn't write this book so he could feed our curiosity about future things. Or so he could use the knowledge in a prideful manner. That's a good quote. We don't use these things to come up with the best new chart we can develop. We use it to motivate us to draw closer to God of knowing what is coming. But too often... We get it twisted, the purpose of this book. We become obsessed with the return of Christ to the point of date setting. Trying to find out the hidden things. It's ridiculous. He gave us this so we could live expectantly. To keep what this book is saying, the truth of it. Again, look at 2 Peter chapter 3. It should motivate us to stay right. Second Peter chapter three, verse eleven. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the, uh, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And he continues. See, what it should do is the truth of, of knowing what is actually coming. To believe it to, allow it, to allow it to motivate you to draw closer to God. <clears throat> to keep the sayings of this book. It has another idea here with guard and to keep. 
to, pr- to protect it from those who try and destroy it and discredit it. Again, many deny it. There's so many false interpretations. Remember, I said this before, there's more commentaries in the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible. There's more ideas about it and crazy stuff written about it than any other book. And what we've just done in coming through this book will help you do just that. To stay faithful to it, to guard it, to keep it. Listen, this book isn't about, as I, as I said, it's amazing what, how people get into this. They get obsessed with, it's called revelation, not hidden nation. It's not about the hidden things that are in there. It's a revealing It's wanting to make known. It's not hidden things throughout. From there he goes on, not only are you to believe it, to keep it, but then worship should be a result. Back in Revelation 22. Christ, remember what's just taken place. Here's John. The angel comes to him again. Let's him know that, listen, John, this is faithful and true. This is going to happen. This is God's word. This is going to be fulfilled. Christ interjects. Right after Christ interjects, he hears the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and John drops. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. When I heard them and what I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Again, it's amazing. Moments after he hears the voice of the Lord. Completely, you know, I understand what John is doing here. I mean, he just hears the voice of the Lord. The, The reality is setting in, and he falls down to worship. Of course, the angel corrects him immediately with what was taking place. I, I, this made me laugh. I was thinking about this. The angel is probably thinking, hello, you do know why Lucifer got cast out? Wanting God's worship? If you think I'm going to let you bow down here and look like you're worshiping me right now, that's not going to happen. You need to get up. And God, I had no idea this guy was going to do this. I'm good. I'm good. That had to be on his mind. <laughs> Just a little bit. But John drops down to worship. Now, John's already been corrected on this once. I don't think John dropped down, it's, it, 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 and that's not the wording of it either. What he did, I don't think, was correct, and we're going to see that in relation to the seriousness of worship, but I don't think he was worshiping the angel. He, he knew of God. I mean, he, knew, he just heard the voice of Christ, and he drops. But in how and where and everything with the angel right there, it wasn't proper. It wasn't right. God takes worship Serious. It shows the importance of worship. And again, the conclusion of what the angel said there is really one of the themes of the book of Revelation. Worship God. That's throughout the book. It, once we remove the, the, obviously the primary idea of the revealing, what's underneath all of it is worship God. <clears throat> Today, of course, what we call worship just like John had an error here falling down before this angel. He should not have fallen down prostrate before angel or any other man. doesn't matter even if his intent and heart was God, which no doubt it was. He just heard the voice of Christ. He's already been corrected to that. He knows God. But in how and what had happened, the angel said, that ain't happening right here. Much like today with what we call worship is not proper. What caused John, by the way, to drop was not a music festival. That's not why he dropped. Oh, I feel the spirit of worship. It wasn't a worship team. You know what it was? The truth of what he just heard. That's why he dropped. The reality of God and what he just heard. There is much confusion on what worship even is today. Most of the worship today in our churches is without a doubt man-centered. The worship team, team sing songs to entertain. Think of the majority of the words of the music today that, that is written. It deals with our struggles, our trials, the storms of life. It's difficult. It's hard. 
Sometimes those things are encouraging. I'm not knocking them, but I am in relation to worship. I'm knocking them every time. That's not what should drive us to worship. Worship is not about you. Matter of fact, by the way, what will help you more with your struggles is the closer you get to God, you know what they seem like? Just small, smaller. Those, those songs make them seem bigger to you. Oh, it's so tough. But when you draw closer to God, they start to look smaller. But the worship today is all about our struggles and our giants and our storms and our mountains. Listen, those things are real and God wants to help us. I'm not, I, I, what I'm knocking them against is when that is in relation to worship. And if that's all you have, that's what you're obsessed with, you are centered on self and not God, and that's not right. <clears throat> These worship songs have a boyfriend and girlfriend feel to it, don't they? They do. That's exactly what they do. The music is playing on your emotions, and you think, oh, it's the spirit of worship. Can you feel it? Just, just head to some regular pop romantic guy songs, and you're going to feel the same spirit. The songs are not centered on God's greatness, but on man's needs. If they do talk of God's greatness... It's not his greatness that controls the mind in the moment. It's the type of music invoked. And if you don't believe me, stop the music and see the response. Where'd the spirit go? What happened? All right, who quenched God's spirit? <laughs> That's exactly what you would hear. Listen, God is not your boyfriend. He's not your new partner. He's the creator of the universe. He deserves our fear, our respect, our honor, our thankfulness, our submissiveness, on and on and on. True worship causes us to consider and appreciate God's character for who he is and what he's done. Worship lifts our perspective from the earthly to the heavenly. In true worship, it's not about feeling music, although one might sing. We are getting a glimpse of how great God is and how much we owe him and we humble ourselves before him and adore him. It's, you know, you, let me try and take worship even on, onto a smaller scale in life or examples when we see it even in the New Testament. Have you ever been there where as you're growing in your faith, and all of a sudden, and it is different than any other knowledge. Like when you're in school, maybe you, you finally get algebra. And there's a little bit of excitement. There, like, oh, I got it. I, th I think I just got this. If something's challenging a little bit and, and it clicks. But I know from the time I've been 16, 17 on, none of that could ever compare to when a truth in God's word clicked. Learning more of him. And that, what goes with it, the awe. You see, it's, it's when, as if John is, is seeing the conclusion of this truth and understanding the greatness of God, and it drops him. He falls prostrate down to, just, to, just to have that. <clears throat> Worship is not to be man-centered. It's always to be God-centered. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. It is a result of who God is and what he has done. One of the things where, where, where I see genuine worship, there's several times in the New Testament. My favorite time, though, is John chapter 11. It's John chapter 11 with how Christ orchestrated those events with the resurrection of Lazarus. That's true worship. There was no songs being played, nothing like that at all. It was when Christ heads to that grave of Lazarus, who's now been in there for four days. And he says, roll away the stone. And again, I just can't wait to watch this when we get to heaven. Just the response. As every, I think everything just stopped when he said, roll away the stone. As if, what is he doing? Again, this will be the third resurrection he had, the, the third person he raised from the dead in his ministry. But none of them had been dead this long. 
I mean, this is to the point that the body is already suffering through corruption from death. And then he makes that statement, Lazarus, that shout, come forth. I can just picture that. You know every single eye is on that tomb. But what happens when he steps out? Every eye switches to Jesus Christ. They just recognize the level of power, awesomeness, awe, God in the flesh. And that worship took place as they switched and focused on him. It's when you learn something more of God, the truth of who he is, what he's doing in your life. <clears throat> so let's go on. We're to believe it as we see in verse six. We're to keep it. It's to lead to worship in our life, the truths that we see. And then verse 10 and 11, we're to proclaim it. And he, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that, uh, he that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Next, here's the instruction given as a result. Of, don't seal this up. This is to be proclaimed. Remember, you go back to Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 12. When Daniel was given the prophetic vision of what was to come, what was he told? Seal it up. Seal it up. This isn't to be proclaimed. But now it's clear. All things, this is the, this is the completed revelation that God has for us. And now he says, no, now it's no longer going to be sealed. Don't seal this up. This is now to be proclaimed. People need to know this. It's now clear what is to come. And we have the responsibility to proclaim it. Of that Lamb of God which was slain from the foundation of the world. Of all the judgment that is to come. Of the only answer being in Jesus Christ. We are to proclaim it. Listen, you better be glad somebody to proclaim the truth to you. That you're not ignorant of what is to take place. And then we see the results of proclaiming this truth in light of eternity in verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, etc. As I've already read, continues along that, along that line. This verse is often misunderstood. Remember, my, my, I, it was 15 years ago, I think exact 15 years ago, I think I was on a furlough. And my dad, who I, I'm not sure if my dad ever got saved. I don't know if he did or not. My last, I do know this, my last conversation with him in person was the gospel. And, but he, I was home on a furlough and he called me up and he would read through the Bible and he, verses would grab and he called me up and said, explain this to me. I remember with two, it was more than two times, but I remember two set verses. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, where many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied on thy name? He called me up on that one. And then I remember this verse. He said, I don't understand that. What's that, what's that talking about there? And almost led him to, to an idea that maybe there was no hope for him. Even he was continually rejecting Christ, and outside of that, there was no hope for him. But, but when he saw that, he was wondering. And this verse, just isolated, somebody just comes to you with this verse. Uh, with no context, it's a difficult verse. But don't remove it from the context, and it's not difficult. The, it, it is in the context of Christ coming quickly of his return that's coming in judgment upon this earth. Of him just, of the, of the angel just saying, by the way, what you've just seen, you don't seal this up. This is to be proclaimed. You see, this is dealing with where man stands when it does come to eternity, how they respond to the truth. It's in no way teaching that God does not want people to repent. Of course he does. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not what he's teaching. The context, again, the return of Christ in judgment. Him coming quickly. Not sealing up the words of this book. It's dealing with what happens when he does return in light of truth. 
See, what determines people's destiny is what they do when they hear truth proclaimed. How one responds to truth does, in fact, fix their eternal destiny. It sets it in stone, done. This verse is a warning that decisions determine character, and your character determines destiny. Doesn't mean character in regards to working for salvation. This certainly goes back to the work of Christ in our life because that's the truth that is given. But it deals with character issues in the verse. Those who hear the truth proclaimed and reject it that are choosing to remain in that filthy state unjust before God. When this day comes, that's how they will remain. That's how they're going to stay. That's how they're going to stay for an eternity. But those who have become righteous, and we know the only who become righteous is through Jesus Christ, will remain that way for an eternity. In other words, it's final. It's done. This is also teaching that once you enter eternity, there's no changing it. None. That, by the way, that refutes the idea of a universal salvation, which is commonly taught. Some key well-known preachers actually began preaching and still do universals. And that's the belief of this, that even if you go to hell, eventually God's going to take you out. That's not true. You'll be there for an eternity. He, you, you, just like that verse says, when this day hits, he that is unjust, he's going to be unjust still. That's not going to change. It also refutes the doctrine of annihilation and soul sleep. Those apart from Christ are not going to be annihilated. They're going to remain in their wretched condition for an eternity. That's how they're going to stay. You die in your lost condition, or you face this judgment in your lost condition, and that will never change. Verse 12. Let's conclude with verse 12. The fifth thing here. Anticipate meeting our Lord. He gives a great promise now. The second time to come quickly is given with a promise. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. There's an anticipation that's also to be given here with Christ's return. He is coming, and every single one of us are going to get to see him. That day will happen. The day will come when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will see the one that God Almighty who became flesh to save you, the one who has more love for you than any than is possible, than any other human could possibly have for you. You're going to see him face to face. You're going to recognize that he is the crucified one. You're going to recognize that that, that moment's going to hit you when you realize the creator, the one who spoke it, is that one who died for you and redeemed you. And now you're faced with it. You see, the days come. I am coming. And my reward is with me. He's saying, listen, even though it gets difficult and it gets hard, stay faithful. My reward is coming. Even if no one knows what you're doing, even if no one knows, he knows. And the reward is coming. See, I, I, I'm, I'm staying faithful. There's just no recognition from it. Just nothing taken. Stay faithful. Listen, number one, always keep those motivations right and do it for the Lord. Whenever I can, I try and recognize when I see that. I'll pull people in the office and tell there's people I've done that with. Listen, thank you. I think you're doing a great job. But there's times that I'm going to miss that. I can't stand it. I want to encourage you to continue to do right. But your ultimate motivation should always be because God sees you. He knows. He knows. Listen, we should try and encourage each other. There's several in here who really have that gift of encouragement. They're great at it. Keep it up. The Lord knows we need that. But listen, if you're not seeing it at the moment, 
Listen, you have it right here. Read it. He knows. It should encourage us to stay faithful. This, of course, is reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15, which deals with the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, in which we will be rewarded for our works. We will stand before him in judgment. And you do see what's important. It's not the quantity. It's what remains when it's all said and done. And by the way, what's he looking at when things are burned up? One of the key things he's looking at is motivation behind it. That's going to lead to false motivation is going to lead to a whole lot of works being gone. Again, even when no one notices, stay faithful. Christ knows and he will, will reward you. Even when it's difficult, stay faithful. Christ knows and he will reward you. Again, five things here. To believe it, to keep it, to worship, to proclaim it, and to anticipate our Lord's return. With heads bowed and eyes.